to see that play out and I think those companies that reconceptualize themselves using data thinking as an ingredient are the ones that are going to prosper and those who don't are going to suffer the Darwinian consequences. So talking about the uh, consequences, I heard you join the uh, Twitter this morning. Yeah. Are you ready to do uh, export now? Uh, because that's the number one thing that's going to happen. Uh, I got a piece of email from somebody this morning saying, all it says is, I'd, look, I'd like to know what they did to you to make you join Twitter. <laughs> well, I hope, uh, you know, it's Paul underscore Moritz, right? And Paul underscore Moritz. So follow him. If you have problems with Pivotal, you know who Paul is. <laughs> uh, thank you, Paul, for making the journey all the way. And thank you for being a friend of Jada on all these years. And uh, good luck to the future. Thank you. By Joe, it's good thing that you know, but it, 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 well, it, it, it looks like uh, you're going to reach the same levels as Prince, but we'll be known as the venture capitalist, formerly known as Omni. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, but, but, uh, uh, you know, talking to you on stage is one of the privileges of my previous life, and I hope I will have it in the future as well, because I quite enjoy learning about new things. And but before I do that, I want to know how your new life has been since you became the CEO of Delta. Uh, good. Uh, uh, as we were discussing briefly beforehand, you know, one of the great privileges in life is to be able to work on interesting problems with good people. Uh, and uh, you know, I certainly have that privilege uh, at Pivotal. I've advanced enough in my years to really appreciate the privilege as well. So I'm, I'm very happy and. Uh, you know, we're in the midst of some really profound shifts in the industry, which will be the next couple of years. So in a year or so, you'll be at the helm of this new, the new pivot out. What, what are the key things you have learned which have a broader application to corporations and uh, data-related industries? Well, perhaps, perhaps the most surprising thing that I've learned here over the last year is, is that for the first time I'm seeing major uh, enterprises, old line enterprises, come to fairly radical conclusions. Uh, so we're starting to see some players in that space uh, have a clear enough line of sight to some new opportunity or some competitive threat that they need to respond to that uh, they're willing to build afresh. They're willing to literally leave their IT legacy behind create a new platform there because they're realizing that either the opportunity or the competitors that they're going to face are, are going to use techniques that the consumer internet giants have pioneered basically to go around you know the cycle of applications data analytics and, and you know building rapidly building applications and experiences extracting all the data analyzing the data and then immediately driving that back into the applications and you know the pioneers and the new entrants in that space are uh, looking at doing going around that cycle much more rapidly, much greater scale, and much lower cost, and doing very disruptive things as a result of that. Uh, so, for the first time, you're seeing major line, O line industries from everything from the industrial space to agriculture to medicine say, We need to build a whole new capability. And, and we're not going to try and do that on top of our legacy. We're going to build a new platform, and the legacy has to cleave to that, not the other way around. So that's kind of a really interesting trend that I think we're seeing the beginning. So, and I think that will only accelerate in the years to come. Can I just parse that a little bit? Let's say a company like Target, which recently has been in use but not the right thing. You know, as a company, they know a lot about us. Yeah. They have a lot of data, but they still don't seem to have, you know, capabilities to do with that data. Like, is it because, you know, they have using an old-fashioned infrastructure that doesn't really live up to today's world, or is it because they just don't think about that as to be You know, at the end of the day, it, it's it's the latter. It's it, it, it's a it's it's a mindset, an attitude, a ability to see what's possible and uh, you know depending on which industry you're in and which 
competitors you're facing, there's nothing like the sight of the gallows to focus the mind. Uh, so you know, those are industries that either, as I said, see clear competitive threats or see a clear line of sight to some new uh, source of revenue are the ones moving quickly. You know, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples here. Uh, businesses are realizing that the end of this data journey is not just about taking advantage of all the data available to them and extracting insights from that. It's about catching uh, customers in the end. So it, uh, that real value accrues when you can provide highly relevant, highly timely contextual information. And uh, give you an example of that, uh, of an industry that now faces this uh, as an immediate and pressing need and is not quite sure what to do about it is you take the telco industry, mobile phone carriers, you're for the first time ever really have to focus on customer satisfaction. You know, now that they've sold the phone to everyone who can fog a mirror in the world, uh, they actually have to worry about churn and such things as that promoter school. But most telcos have no way to really tell the actual experience that an individual consumer has for their product. You know, when they sell you a phone, they know a lot about you in a person. But pick up your phone and make a call, you just become traffic at that point. And they, they treat everyone the same. And they, they need to now differentiate in real time or, and be able to understand the actual experience that different profiles of customers are having with the network. You know, the, the base station is overloaded. They need to say, who are we going to kick off? I'll just kick somebody off the brand. To do that, they've got to take offline profile data that they've built up of their, of their customers and intersect it with high-speed, real-time data that's coming off the backbones of their networks and take decisions in a matter of seconds as to what they're going to do. That, that is now going to become a matter of life and death for those industries. And the interesting thing, there's nothing in their existing either network platforms or IT platforms that can do that, so they're going to have to move in that way. If you go back to a target, it's not just that they need to adopt better practices of, 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 under, of protecting their data. They have to say, how do we give highly contextual and real-time information to our shoppers? How do we catch them in the act of actually making a decision? And uh, it takes a certain leadership to get over that hump and say, this is important enough that we're actually going to go do this. Uh, you know, we're, as you know, uh, General Electric is, is uh, uh, a investor in Pivotal, uh, and uh, one of the interesting things, I don't think you'll mind me telling the story, that I was at uh, dinner three months ago, four months ago, with, with, with a bunch of other people, and Jeff Himmel, the, uh, the head of GE, and uh, somebody at the end of the dinner asked him this question and said, look, Jeff, what do you really do? You know, you're the head of this 138-year-old, 400,000-person giant industrial company. What, what do you actually do? And he had a very interesting answer. He said, look, I really do three things. One is I try and make sure that GE is in the industries that GE is well suited to be in. And you know, our DNA is dealing in big capital intensive complex industries. That's why we got into oil and gas and have done very well there. Why we sold off NBC Universal because we don't add any value to that. Certainly, he said, I need to have the management teams, two generations, uh, who can run those big businesses in predictable ways. And then he gave the most interesting answer, which was the third point. He said, and then I have to know when to short circuit those predictable processes. Uh, to be able to know when there's a significant enough change in the landscape that I have to force this giant world tanker against its will to change direction. Uh, and he said, this whole Internet of Things is one of those situations where I realized I had to change the direction of the world tanker. Uh, that I, I couldn't just let it continue sailing uh, in business as usual. And you know, they created the whole new capability to allow them to build new generations of applications that can take the telemetry coming off all their machines and do interesting things with it. But it requires somebody in the organization with that conviction and strength uh, to really do that. Sure. Talking about Jeff Hamill as the team changes in this company. We look at the tools out there. Are there enough tools in our 
know, platforms available for people to actually analyze and contextualize information in real time? Or we still have to still invent many of those things? Well, you know, at, at the risk of being self-servicing, that, that's why Pivotal was created, <laughs> because we believe it, that we needed to put together the right set of ingredients that would allow mere mortals and enterprises to, to be able to do what the consumer and the giants have done and, and exploit the two quantities that have really driven uh, their capabilities, which is the paradigm of using lots and lots of cheap machines working in parallel and lots and lots of cheap storage. And if you abstract far enough away from Hadoop, you'll realize that Hadoop is really an instance of that paradigm. It, it's a framework for exploiting lots and lots of cheap machines and lots and lots of cheap storage. That paradigm needs to be extended quite radically uh, beyond the somewhat idiosyncratic way of working with attributes into other semantic paradigms of working with information. That needs to happen. Uh, and certainly, we need to find ways to allow people to build these applications that can exploit the resources in the cloud, can exploit whoever it is, who can give them the right uh, cost structure in terms of lots of cheap machines and lots of cheap storage in the right location uh, and allow those applications to be built in a portable, cloud independent manner. Uh, because if you take GE's case, uh, if they build a set of capabilities to absorb all the telemetry or the electricity generating infrastructure and optimize that and they sell that infrastructure to a sovereign nation, don't care whether it's Germany, Brazil, China, they're not going to let them take that telemetry out of the country. And that's national infrastructure at that point. So you're going to have to drop those capabilities on whatever cloud they tell you to drop it on. Yes, Snowden, if he's done one favor of the world, has drawn a line under why it's important for governments to think about cloud affordability and cloud independence. So, you know, our industry is still, you can see the outlines of the directions in both of those trends. In other words, how we move beyond the do and how we move to a truly cloud portable, cloud independent way of starting to emerge. Uh, and, you know, we have had our hat in that range of kind of working in an open, collaborative way, but there'll be others as well. But it's one thing I'm now 100% convinced of is it, is it has to happen. Now, you know, in 2007, 2006, 2007 time frame, the, the idea of cloud was essentially S3. From Amazon, and you know, fast forward to today, the cloud is just you know, much more robust than that. Do you think, from a data standpoint, are we still in the 2007 2009 range? We still have because the new build is actually the equivalent of S2. Well, I, I, I think the group has done two very important things. Uh, one is it has opened people's eyes to what can be done if you take this alternative view of a computing architecture of how do you put lots of cheap machines and lots of cheap storage to work in, in a way to be able to handle data sets that are dramatically larger on a cost structure that's dramatically cheaper than traditional BI data warehousing architectures. Businesses are starting to wake up to that, which is why you, you've seen the growth rates of the existing BI data warehouse vendors basically plateau when you start to shrink. So there's this deepening realization by enterprises they need to get off to a different substrate here. And, and you, you know, deserves full recognition as the pioneer for doing that, that it's not sufficient. Uh, we have to extend that paradigm to other ways of working with data over the years. Uh, and, and that will certainly happen. So I, I, I think we're in both the data side and the cloud side, we're on a journey here. Now, the trajectory is being be set and it's going to happen, but we're in the first third uh, of the journey still. Now, when you, when you talk about the journey, the one thing that you were probably discussing backstage is the need for bad thinking, you know, which is not there in the corporation just yet, even though there's a lot of talk about big data, big data, big data, but nobody really knows how to put it in the world. The actual business strategy that are there. You can look at Facebook, all their business strategy is based on that. Uber is essentially a data company. So 
Can you elaborate on that? Well, you know, they're, they're, they're the new entrants like the Uber who are coming at it from a data point of view. I think the interesting thing is the there's some old line enterprises who are realizing that if they adopt the data centric view of the world, they can literally rethink their businesses and, and tap into whole new sources of revenue. A, a good example of this uh, would be a very large company in the agricultural seed chemical space who realize that if, if they look at agriculture as a big data problem, uh, and if they can combine that with much more granular data about the fields that we're planting in it and, and be able to discriminate between one corner of the field and the other, and know that this corner is you know, 10 meters higher than the other, so we're going to plant differently, they use a different seed, and we're going to combine that with big data coming from climate models, etc. Right, if they do that, they could, without any increase in land, water, fertilizer, increase crop yields by at least 10%. And uh, they say, you know, you guys in the computer industry turn off your noses at 10%. But in, in, in a world where it's going to have to increase its food supply by 50% in the next 30 years, otherwise there really will be starvation. This is a big, big deal. Uh, so you're starting to see these companies that you would never have thought of as big data companies or data influence companies reconceptualize themselves. GE being a classic example where, uh, you know, Folks went to Jeff Annals, and I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing grotesquely here, and, and said, look, Jeff, when, when all the consumers in the world got connected to the internet, mm -hmm. that enables radical change. Uh, and if we're not careful, all the internet, all the machines in the world are going to get connected to the internet, and that will enable radical change. And we should take advantage of that as a